I'm Clive Priddle. Uh, this is a special edition of The Current. We have a roundtable today, um, especially gathered to acknowledge the anniversary since the death of George Floyd uh, in Minnesota. Uh, we wanted to have uh, an opportunity to ask ourselves some tough questions about how far the country has come during that year, what we've learned, um, and, and where the nation is, you know, what road we're on going forward. Uh, I am very happy to say we've been joined by uh, three wonderful contributors. Um, Radley Balco is a Washington Post uh, opinion columnist. Uh, he is the author of The Rise of the Warrior Cop, and his reporting has a special focus on criminal justice. Keith Boykin is a CNN political commentator. Uh, he is also the author of Race Against Time. And Maya Rao is author of The Great American Outpost, but we're particularly glad that she can join us because her day job is as the race and immigration reporter for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. So let's start our conversation today uh, with the person who has been reporting most closely from Minnesota. Maya, can you tell us what it's been like to cover uh, this whole story from the moment uh, of George Floyd's killing through to the trial, of course, of the first police officer uh, and to the present. What's the mood like in Minneapolis? Uh, how is the, the, the city and the state recovering? Sure. So um, like a lot of newsrooms, uh, we are, the Minneapolis Star Tribune had had um, had all of us reporters work remotely with COVID. And we were supposed to not do any in-person interviews unless it was really important. And so George Floyd's killing hit a couple months after that happened and all those rules went out the window. Um, you know, I've lived in the city off and on since 2012 and I've never seen um, the city quite as on edge as it was in the last year. And so, um, you know, reporters were just out constantly um, because not only did was George Floyd's death, um, you know, bringing everybody out, you know, there was, there were riots on the streets. And so, um, you know, I was out covering some of that. Um, and then, you know, there was just um, a lot of, it was just a it, whole city just really felt like it was on edge. I've never interviewed so many people over the last year who just broke down in tears during interviews, you know, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with business owners who, who were, a lot of them were Black and Latino and Asian immigrants who lost their whole life's work as their buildings were burned. Um, we saw a huge surge in crime that also left people on edge as everyone was calling for the defund police movement. Um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time on last year that really consumed me was trying to delve a bit more into George Floyd's life and trying to tell a narrative of who he was just beyond this uh, symbol um, and someone who people really knew through chants at Black Lives Matter protests and, and through the video of his death, um, but that you know, people didn't really have a big sense of who he was. And so that was really um, important work for me. Um, and what I found was that Floyd, you know, he grew up in Houston um, which is where I am today, sort of reporting on the one year anniversary of Floyd's death. His family and friends are, are largely here. Um, but Floyd had gone through a lot of struggles after getting out of prison um, in around 2013. Uh, he'd grown up in poverty, was struggling to find work. And, um, you know, so he, through a local pastor here in Houston, he was able to get a referral to come to Minneapolis to seek treatment for addiction uh, and also to get job training. And so I learned there was a whole pipeline of men coming from Minneapolis, or coming from Houston to Minneapolis. Um, a lot of were Black men who knew each other, um, who had dealt with a lot of poverty and addiction issues. And so I, I remember finding that really interesting, like what these men who had grown up in an impoverished black neighborhood coming to a very insular white state. Um, that, so I talked to some of Floyd's friends about that who had made similar journeys. Um, and a lot of them actually really liked Minnesota. And that was one of the sad things about this story um, that Floyd really was doing fairly well um, in his three years in Minnesota before he was killed. Uh, he came up in winter 2017. 
and um, he was able to find work. He was able to get addiction treatment. He was able to make friends, um, able to find a girlfriend uh, who he was close with. And, um, you know, he, he really saw a lot of the good in Minnesota, but one of the interesting things that his friends and probably Floyd were not likely aware of was uh, Minnesota is home to some of the largest racial disparities in the country. And you know, I grew up in Maryland in the DC area, which is very racially diverse and you'll meet people of color from all different um, socioeconomic classes and backgrounds. One of the interesting things about Minnesota that has jumped out at me right away is how um, uh, people of color and the black population disproportionately skews very low income. Um, so there's just these large gaps that I think cause a lot of tension and sort of play into how Minnesota became ground zero for racial justice. Let me ask Radley, um, how do you think the police departments are reacting to uh, events like the, the George Floyd killing? As, as Maya just said, these killings have taken place for years before uh, and we haven't seen a dramatic change in policing strategies or approach to racial um, disparities. Um, did, did, can you see any signs that, that there is a general attempt from the police forces to do this better? We've seen these kinds of protests before, obviously. So I think one thing that's important to remember is, is everywhere where we've seen protests like this, you know, the protests aren't usually about the particular incident that sparked them, right? Um, the, the, the LA riots, um, you know, of course they were in response to, to Rodney King, but there was, you know, a, a couple of generations of tension that, that brought us to that point. The, the Ferguson protests, you know, um, uh, Michael Brown, you know, was the fuse, but, you know, the, 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 the tension that had been building up for, for decades with all these municipalities in St. Louis County and fines and fees and the sort of cycle of poverty that it perpetuated. And I think that, you know, this is the same in, in, in Baltimore uh, with Freddie Gray, and now I think in, in Minneapolis, um, you do see this kind of history of tension between police and, and communities of color. Um, and, you know, in the Minneapolis area, at least, uh, I know Maya had mentioned um, the, uh, the Philando case, um, you know, there are, there are two kind of competing factions in policing right now. There are the progressive uh, kind of reform movement in policing that you see articulated by big city police chiefs, really in, in most large cities in the country, I think, including Minneapolis. But then under the surface, there's this kind of reactionary um, uh, my, policing mindset that is becoming increasingly popular and I think is, is competitive with kind of the reform oriented uh, movement in policing. And this is this idea of, of um, that police need to actually be shooting more people, that uh, they shouldn't be hesitating because hesitation, you know, puts their own lives at risk, it puts other people's lives at risk. Um, and, you know, this is what we saw, I think, with with uh, Philando Castile, you know, that officer had taken one of these train these classes called Bulletproof Warrior classes uh, taught by Caliber Press. Um, and I've written quite a bit about Call it that press. Um, this is a group that puts on these classes all over the country that basically teach police officers to be. The idea is that uh, it's kind of referred to sometimes as the sheepdog mentality. Um, it's kind of it, it, it coincides with a lot of the punisher imagery that you see among law enforcement. And it is this idea that police are constantly under attack. They have targets on their backs. They need to react more quickly. They need to shoot more quickly. Um, and, you know, I, I call it no hesitation policing. And, you know, I think that's that kind of mentality, that the idea that, um, you know, the police officers need to, not so much that they're serving the community, that they're protecting and serving, but the police, a police officer's primary goal should be, you know, to get home safely every night. That's that's what, that's what matters more than anything else. Um, and so that's, you know, that's how you get cases where police officers end up shooting, you know, kids who are carrying pellet guns or BB guns. Um, or no gun, for that matter. It's it's how you get uh, like Glenda Castile, who did everything a gun owner, a legal gun owner, is supposed to do during a traffic stop, uh, right? And ended up getting shot and killed anyway. Um, so you have both of these things going on, and you know, in, in Minneapolis, you know, you do have a fairly progressive-minded police chief there, but you also have a police union that, at least until recently, was run by a guy who, you know, had I I, I think it'd be 
you could safely say dozens of police of citizen complaints against them over the years. Um, a guy who actually, when the city of Minneapolis barred its officers from t attending the bulletproof warrior type classes, said that the police union would pay for any officers that wanted to go and attend those classes on their own. Um, and so there, I, I think you see this kind of clash between these two philosophies. Um, that said, you know, I, I, I'm as optimistic after the George Floyd uh, protests as I've been, I think, in by 15 to 20 years of covering this issue. Um, we have seen massive reform uh, on the ground in, in cities across the country. And I'm going to talk about defunding. There's been very little actual defunding that's going on. Jeff's seen lots of cities, I think probably well over a dozen cities now have banned uh, no-knock raids. You have a couple of states that have banned it, including Virginia, which is a, a really good sort of what I would consider a, a thorough ban with not a lot of loopholes in it. Um, and you've seen, you know, bans on chokeholds. You've seen, we've seen uh, lots of cities embrace programs like the Gooth program based in Eugene, Oregon, which uh, instead of sending the police when someone calls 911 because a friend or, or loved one is having a mental health breakdown, you know, instead of sending the SWAT team, which I've always thought is the most absurd way you could possibly react to a situation where somebody's having a, a mental health crisis, uh, they send a counselor and an EMT. And if they need to, they can then call the police, you know, once they've arrived. But what they found in places like Denver and, and uh, Eugene, uh, I believe Indianapolis has it too, so they tend not to need to call the police. It's a very tiny, tiny percentage of cases. And so these situations get, you know, solved by people who have experience dealing with people in crisis. Um, you know, there are, we're seeing more and more cities start asking, is it really necessary to have police, for example, doing tra traffic enforcement where you have an armed sort of, you know, uh, with people alongside the road. And uh, these are situations that tend to, these are the situations that sort of tend to escalate and, and spiral because you have uh, motorists who are distrustful of police, particularly people of color, because they're disproportionately stopped and searched. Um, and you have police officers who sort of have it drummed into their head from day one of the academy that, uh, you know, every every traffic stop, there's a risk of being ambushed if somebody pulling a gun out and shooting you. Uh, and it's, it's actually, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of, I think it's one in every seven or eight million police stops, you know, in with an officer fatally attacked. Um, but the, but they do have this, this animosity. So, I, you know, I think getting police out of traffic enforcement, uh, rethinking police in schools, um, the CAHOOT program, violence interruption, it's a good time to start, you know, thinking creatively. And there are, I think the, the political movement behind this is encouraging for cities to try new things. Um, you know, we are seeing, as Maya mentioned, a, a surge in violence. I'm not at all convinced that it's directly related to protests. May, probably more, there, there's a stronger case for that in Minneapolis, I think, than anywhere else in the country. But we did see that the, the violent crimes started going up uh, before the protests. It started going up in February and March in most large cities. Uh, and I think it's probably more related to the pandemic um, than the protests in most cities. Um, I, I do think there's a strong case that in Minneapolis, there's been such you know, as being sort of the epicenter of this, um, that there, there, there's a closer connection there. But, you know, we're seeing across the country um, uh, this, this surge of violence, but it began well before uh, the protests. Well, I was going to ask about the, the, this, this idea that the police should not be uh, as directly involved in non-life-threatening situations. Um, I think Brooklyn Center just uh, voted to replace uh, some of the police functions with civilian um, specialists, uh, especially when when it's essentially a, a, a domestic crisis rather than a sort of uh, a public threat, um, but the police union in Brooklyn Center voted against those changes, um, and you know at the very time that the police officer was on trial for killing George Floyd, the police union or the police police headquarters in Brooklyn Center was flying. Um, the uh, the blue the blue lives matter flag. Um, so, how confident are you that the police can stand down and stand down graciously? And uh, oh, they're not going. To. I mean, they're they're, they're going to fight at every step of the of the way. Um, and you know, I, these things that I think that we should do, you know, they're not about abolishing police, but they are about shrinking the policing footprint in this country. Right? It's 
It's about having fewer interactions between police and citizens. Uh, and I think, you know, fewer interactions means fewer opportunities for, for things to escalate in, into violence. Do you feel that people who are actively engaged in those protests and the movement to restore uh, a better sense of criminal justice to all people in America, do you feel that they're confident they're making progress here? Or is there still a lot of um, unresolved resentment at the unfairness? Well, it depends on how you define progress. Um, in terms of forcing a conversation, I think it's clear that the Black Lives Matter movement, the uh, police protest movement, the anti-policing movement have clearly changed the dynamic of the conversation and advanced the conversation. In terms of creating the beginning of a reform movement, I think the, the, the movement has also been successful. But in terms of actual real substantive change, getting the police to stop killing people, I don't think it's accomplished anything. And that's why I actually believe, and I've just stated this for the first time ever two days ago on Twitter, I don't believe the police can be reformed. I think the police are a violent, racist, self-justifying institution that have to be completely destroyed and abolished. I think we have to start over, create new models for public safety that focus on actually protecting people and not on hyper-aggressive law enforcement. I don't think you can do that with the existing institutions. I don't think you can do that with the existing culture in those institutions. I don't think you can do that with the existing people in those institutions. And I think reform is not likely to succeed. There has to be something more radical than that. I'll give you an example. Here in New York City, uh, we elected a, a reformist mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, a few terms ago. He promised, put out his black son on, on television ads, promised that he understood the plight of black people who were suffering through police violence in the Bloomberg and Giuliani area. He promised he would do something about it. Well, he hasn't really done anything about it. I mean, the stop and frisk policy has re been reduced in New York City, but that was a result of a, ju a judicial order. And it actually started decreasing before uh, de Blasio took office. But the hyper-aggressive policing, the killing of, of, of civilians has not ended. And in fact, what disturbed me as well is that in this pluralistic, highly diverse city, our Black Lives Matter activist mayor appointed two two different um, police chiefs in his term. Uh, I want to say three, but I think it's just two. And they're both white Irish American men. I mean, this this is a reflection of just how the, the, the myopic mindset, even the people who call themselves progressives, fail to rise to the moment to be able to cha challenge the situation, challenge the situation. You keep, you keep appointing the same people, keep, uh, keep thinking the same way, things aren't going to change. I just want to go back to a few other things that I heard earlier too. Uh, uh, from Maya and Radley. Um, we're talking about the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death, but it's also uh, around the same time of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Road Flight, uh, the Tulsa massacre where hundreds of black people lost their lives, thousands of, of homes and businesses were destroyed in Tulsa, Oklahoma because of a white racist massacre that took place 100 years ago on June 1st, 19. Um, I was in Houston um, last year at the day, on the day when um, when George Floyd was killed. It was also the same day when Christian Cooper in New York City was uh, uh, falsely accused of uh, harassing and assaulting a white woman in Central Park, something that did not happen. Uh, and that was also a reflection of the fact that we have too many citizens out there who are calling the police um, and using the police as their own sort of personal um, protective force against people of color, which is disturbing. 
Um, the other thing about George Floyd in particular is that George Floyd was actually the victim of several different crises that took place last year. We all know he was the victim of the racial justice crisis in policing, but we also found out through the trial that he was uh, he had COVID. He was a victim of the, the health crisis, the coronavirus crisis. We also discovered that he had recently lost his job, but he was because of the pandemic. So he was a victim of the economic crisis that took place last year. And um, because of his death and the protests that, that came afterwards, he became sort of the, the catalyst for the fourth crisis of, the, of 2020, which was the, uh, the democracy crisis, uh, the, the failure to respect the, the will of the people and, and the democratic election. So I covered the protests, as you mentioned, Clive, last year uh, here in New York City. I had a chance to go to several of the protests. As you know, I was arrested at one of those protests. Um, and I watched the nation's response to those protests. And all the protests I saw, by the way, were very peaceful. Uh, and I know that every protest that took place across the country was not peaceful, and some of those were hijacked by outsiders. But for the most part, the protests were peaceful. And I saw that the response was troubling to me um, from the response in Washington, D.C., where the president tear gassed peaceful protesters outside the White House to conduct a photo op to the response in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where Cal Rittenhouse uh, shot and killed two people who were protesting, um, and then walked right past the police while carrying a gun. A teenager walked right past the police carrying a gun and went home across state lines, and nobody even bothered to, to question him. I, I also watched that couple in St. Louis, the city where I'm from, um, when they brandished their guns to fight against or to, to threaten Black Lives Matter protesters outside their home. Uh, and now that guy who was one of the one of the, the male part of the couple uh, is running for the United States Senate in St. Louis. And I, and I was there in Ferguson in 2014 when um, when uh, protesters were attacking in, in the, the demonstrations against uh, the police killing of Michael Brown. I was one of the people who was tear gassed in 2014. So my own perspective on this has become much more radicalized over the course of the, of the past few years. A few years ago, if you asked me, I would think, oh, well, we need to just do more reforms and we'll get to the point where we can reduce the number of police killings. Now, I don't think that's enough. And I think it's okay from a political perspective that there are people out there who are making quote unquote radical statements like defund the police and abolish the police because that moves the ball forward. It forces the Democrats as a party, if they are a left-wing party or, or a left and center party, to come up with better alternatives. Because if you can't solve the problem of policing with reform, then ultimately we're going to have to scrap policing altogether and come up with something altogether, something altogether different. And I don't think that the Democrats have been pushed far enough until recently to start to even think creatively about what those solutions look like. So, so I, I want to ask... Um... Uh, both Radley and Maya, uh, picking up from what Keith said, um, do you think the police can put their guns down in any way, shape or form? Uh, and Radley, you've written about this at length, about how the police have become ever more militarized, ever more uh, tooled up, um, that, the, that their whole sort of frame of reference for engaging with the public has become as, as a quasi-militia and not as a community service. And, and I guess my, my question for Maya is, um, let's suppose that Keith got his way and, and disbanded the police force and replaced it with something new. Do you think that those small business owners would be reassured uh, by that? Would they feel secure? Is there a way to help them feel that their, their business is going to be protected if the police that they know are no longer around? That's an interesting question about the small business owners because I, I did spend a lot of time with them, especially last year, and there was um, definitely, I would say, most of them were quite sympathetic to George Floyd and to the Black Lives Matter movement, but there was a lot of frustration and anger with story after story of, of um, business owners saying they called 911 the night of those riots many, many times and nobody responded. Some of these people felt like they they had immigrated here from other countries where they, they might have expected this in a third world country, but they did, did not expect this in America. I, I definitely talked to a lot of those folks who are frustrated with defund, the defund police movement. They just want 
a police force that works. So there's this uh, phenomenon called the Ferguson effect that may or may not exist. There's a lot of debate over it. There are also d- different debates about how to define it. But the, the way it's kind of used in pro-law enforcement groups is that when there's protests, when there's a lot of criticism of police, when police are disciplined, uh, when police are fired or criminally charged, that other officers will stop proactive policing and that this uh, has caused increases in particularly in violent crime uh, after you know incidents like Ferguson or the George Floyd protest. Um, the evidence for the Fer- for a Ferguson effect is kind of mixed, but there's also a, a kind of corresponding uh, Ferguson effect. Before I get to that, let me just say first the idea that defenders of police are arguing that the police, when police are criticized or when there's protest or when they're, when bad cops are held accountable, that the police will knowingly stop doing their jobs, which they know will allow more people to be murdered or otherwise sort of violently attacked. Um, that's absurd to me. I mean, I mean, the idea that that, that is a defense of, of law enforcement or that comes from the people who defend law enforcement, basically saying, they're saying, if you criticize us, we're going to let a lot of people die. Um, and I'm not saying it's absurd in that I don't think it happens or I don't think, I think it's impossible or I can't even env- envision something like that. I do think it's absurd to say that this is something that you should expect, right? I mean, um, you know, I'm a journalist. Uh, if I you know, basically threatened to just stop doing my job every time someone criticized the media. First, there'll probably be some people who are very completely okay with that. <laughs> but also, you know, I, I think bad journalists should be exposed. I think they should lose their jobs if you, you know, make up stories or lie in stories or, uh, you know, publish fake news. Um, so there's that part of the Ferguson effect. But I do think there's there's good evidence for a kind of a reverse Ferguson effect. And that is that when you see protests like this, as I said, they tend to be in communities where there is a history of police violence, where there is a history of racial discrimination by police. And that's why you see protests sort of explode the way they do after there's one of these precipitating incidents. Um, and what we've also found is there's, and there's some, there's some academic work backing this up, is that people are, don't call the police as often in these communities. There was a great study in, um, in uh, Milwaukee that found that after a, a high profile uh, uh, police abuse incident there, uh, 911 calls from black neighborhoods in Milwaukee dropped dramatically. Um, and then they dropped again every time there was even a national in, uh, news incident uh, involving police abuse, or police brutality. Um, there are polls showing that in black communities uh, across the country, people are, are more afraid of the police than they are of criminals. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty bad situation to be in. I, I remember, you know, in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, late 90s, there was the, the stop snitching movement uh, had kind of taken hold. And, you know, I remember reactions among sort of conservatives and law and order types who were sort of horrified that, you know, people would tell other people not to cooperate with the police to say solve a murder. For example. Um, but I think, you know, what people missed about the stop snitching movement is it was illustrative of this fact that there are communities in this country where people trust or have less trust in police than they do in people who they consider to be criminals in their community. Uh, and that does not speak well to police at all. And it also probably is driven by the fact that police have their own stop stitching movement, uh, which is much more successful, uh, called the Blue Wall of Silence, um, which we just saw sort of finally breached, I think, in, in the Chauvin trial. Um, I wanted to touch on one thing that Keith had mentioned um, with de Blasio. Now, there was a moment in de Bla- early in de Blasio's administration, uh, it was after the Eric Garner protests, uh, and there were two police officers, NYPD officers, who were, who were ambushed and shot and killed in their cars. And, of course, that's awful and, and tragic. And, and, and you know, uh, nobody, you know, thinks that's a good thing. We all think that that was a, a terrible thing. But, you know, de Blasio had just been sort of, he had, there was some, uh, he had told, uh, I think there was sort of a private meeting where he had told people that he had told his mixed race son uh, that he should be, go out of his way to cooperate with police, basically so that he doesn't get beaten or, or killed. Um, And, you know, that's good advice for anyone, right, to cooperate with the police, to, you know, raise your issues, file your lawsuit later. But, you know, for the time being, the people with the guns, you should probably do what they say so that, you know, especially if you know that they're going to fly, you know, there's a a chance they may fly off the handle. Um, But this came out that he had said this to his mixed race son and the police community, law enforcement community took great offense to this. And at the funeral of these two officers who were ambushed, the, the Blasio 
gave a eulogy and the entire, uh, pretty much the entire police presence at the funeral stood up and turned their backs to him. Uh, and from that moment on, de Blasio took a very, very less aggressive reform position. Uh, and I think what it did is it really showed you the immense power of, of police unions and of police political power. I mean, here's a, a progressive city, a city, you know, probably one of the most diverse cities in the world, if not the most diverse city. Here's a mayor who specifically ran on a police reform platform uh, and, and was elected on it. Uh, and he offers the most sort of tepid criticism of the police, that he told his mixed race son that he should, you know, follow police instructions. And the police reacted in such a disproportionate and exaggerated way that it clearly terrified de Blasio. It clearly like made him think twice about this entire agenda, agenda that he had run on and that he had promised. Uh, and, you know, I think that tells us just how difficult uh, major reforms or, or even sort of alternatives to policing are going to be uh, going forward. Bradley, I agree with what you said, particularly about the police being scared about, uh, particularly about Bill de Blasio rather being scared after the police response on um, his statement about his son, uh, it reminded me of a couple of things. It reminded me of President Obama on a couple of occasions. One, when President Obama said that if he had a son, his son would look like Trayvon, and people attacked him for that, Trayvon Martin. Another, when President Obama said that um, the Cambridge, Massachusetts police acted stupidly when they uh, arrested uh, Harvard professor Skip, Skip Gates for breaking into his own home. And the police attacked him for that. And Obama had to have a beer summit at the White House because of that. Uh, it also reminded me, of, there's a scene, I think, in a Batman movie like that, where the police would turn their backs on, on the police commission or something like that. Uh, but the thing that most struck me is it reminded me of something that took place just a block away from my house here in the 1950s and 1960s. Malcolm X. Um, led a group of Nation of Islam protesters uh, to the police precinct, the 28th police precinct, to block away from my house here in Harlem to protest the uh, attack on a, a black a black man. Um, and the the police were intimidated by this phalanx of uh, black people who had assembled outside the uh, the precinct uh, until Malcolm X, uh, in the film version, he snapped his fingers and ordered him, ordered them to leave. In the reality version, he told them to leave. And the police uh, a sergeant uh, reportedly said at that point, that's too much power for one man to have. Uh, well, the reality is the police unions have too much power today. They have too much power over our lives, over city officials' lives, and they have very little accountability. And that's what's so disturbing. They oppose any effort to implement any sort of accountability. So the, the only other thing I wanted to say is go back to this comment about the Ferguson effect that you made, Bradley. And um, I think what I saw here, what I remember seeing here in New York City, that was sort of the same um, fear that was driving the, the unwillingness of local officials in New York to remove stop and frisk as a policy. And what happened was after stop and frisk was, was removed as a regular enforcement policy, the number of stops and frisks went down to from something like, something like 700,000 a year to fewer than a, a thousand or something like that, I believe. Um, and as a result, the crime rate didn't go up. There was this big fear that if you, even Donald Trump said this recently, which was inaccurate, that you, if, if you eliminate stop and frisk, the crime rate will go up. We know what the crime rate had been on this steady trajectory downward since the 1990s, and it continues downward. Even though we've had a, a blip in increase in crime in the past year or so, the, the crime rates in, in big cities are still significantly lower than they have been in decades, uh, historically, in practically every city in the country. And that's another part that doesn't get talked about. Uh, but we do see incidents where it seems like the police are sort of um, not willing to, to pay attention or do their jobs. It does cause a sense of distrust, uh, particularly for people of color communities that are used to being over-policed. Um, and and I, I just think that these are important issues. That's one, one last thing. Um, about defund the police. I think when people say defund the police, I can't speak for everyone, but when I hear that, I don't hear, let's not have a public safety force to protect us if somebody tries to kill me or if somebody tries to rape someone or somebody tries to kidnap someone. What I hear is let's redirect those resources. 
let's stop putting billions and billions of dollars into policing and the, and the increased militarization of policing. Let's start putting money into jobs and healthcare and education and housing and ending homelessness and improving our client, climate and so making sure that people don't have, making sure that people have safe drinking water and, 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 and aren't living in polluted communities. I think if we did those things, if we actually invested our resources in protecting our people and real public safety, then we wouldn't have the need for as much crime as we have today. That's the argument that I think of when I hear defunding the police. Yeah, and it's impossible not to uh, to to be reminded of the circumstances of Dante Wright's killing, which started with him driving with expired plates, which is not really a life-threatening crime to anybody. Um, or... and, again, and again, something that could be enforced with you take a photo of a license plate and you send them a ticket in the mail. I mean, you know, right. that's that's the ultimate product of a, of a traffic stop anyway, is you get a ticket that you can choose to pay or you can choose to fight, which is the same thing as if it comes in the mail. The idea that you need an armed confrontation to let somebody know that their, light, their plate is expired, I think is, you know, we don't have to accept that. And even in the case of something like Makia Bryant, where uh, her sister actually called for assistance because there was a domestic argument and two women had grabbed knives from a kitchen drawer. But the, the one person, as far as I can see from the footage that I saw, who was not threatened by that argument directly was the police officer who raised his gun and shot her. Um, it just seems like, you know, a hideously inappropriate tool to solve a serious situation that the gun just didn't do any good well it's also the case with andrew brown i mean i mean the police the, the district attorney a few a few days ago made an announcement that the police were justified in killing him because he was using his weapon his car as a weapon but the police surrounded the front of his car his, his, his instinct wasn't to run them over by driving forward, but to put the car in reverse and get away from the police. He was clearly trying to escape the police, not trying to kill them. And even as he was driving away from them, they shot him in the back. And, and then the district attorney gets up there and justifies it. So we have this whole sort of complicity, this, this, uh, this cabal of people from the district attorneys to the prosecutors, to the police officers, to the judges, and this whole system of mass incarceration. You know, I. I all again for, for crimes that don't necessarily threaten public safety. And this is why I go back to this whole argument about not just about the police, but about mass incarceration policies. I'm of the belief now, this is again how I've become more radicalized. I don't think anybody should be going to prison for any nonviolent crimes. I think we should save, if we have prisons at all, we should save them for, for the purposes of people who actually pose a threat to, to society, not because somebody passes a bad check or uses a, a counterfeit $20. I mean, the, the whole notion, we have to rethink the whole notion of what we're doing here in America. Why is that we continue to kill so, so many thousands and thousands of people in this country? Why are police continue to kill thousands and thousands of people? Why are 20,000 people a year dying from gun violence in this country? Why is it not happening in any other country, any other civilized developed country except ours? And how do we consider ourselves an exceptional country? What do we mean when we talk about American ex exceptionalism? We have all these problems in our country and we just pretend like it's normal. Yeah, the, 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 the Brown case is particularly bad because the, there, there is no, there's a reason why most large police departments in the country have banned officers from shooting into moving cars. There is almost no scenario where that should be justified. The only the only scenario I think where it makes some sense possibly is if you get a situation like the terrorist attack in Nice, where you have somebody using a car to sort of run people down, and you want to you know put an end to that. But in any other situation, I mean, even if the police, even if someone is driving a car directly at a police officer, if you shoot and kill the driver, that doesn't stop the car. The car continues to go in the direction that it was going. And you should probably spend, you know, your, your efforts and your energy trying to get out of the way of the car than, than killing the driver. And of course, in this case, he was shot, you know, from the back. And, and it, it makes, not only did it not stop the car, it makes the car continue to go at the speed it's going. But now no one's controlling it. And so now it's more dangerous for everybody, you know, anybody who happens to be in the vicinity of the car. I mean, I've written about a lot of these cases where police shoot in the moving cars. And, and over and over and over again, what you see is the police report will say, you know, the car was heading right at me. 
then you look at the ballistics and all the bullet holes are in the side or the back of the car. And, and what happened was the cops got angry because this person was trying to get away. Uh, and, you know, unless it's somebody who's just murdered a bunch of people and they're trying to get away, um, you know, there are very few crimes where it would seem to be justified to shoot someone as they're driving away. Um, you can always try to apprehend somebody later. You can always, you know, send somebody to, to you know, get them as they're coming or going. Um, you know, I think there's a reason why they're not showing us the video in that case, and that's because they know that, it, that the public wouldn't accept it if they saw it. When the video vindicates them, they let it, they release it pretty early. <laughs> I wanted to jump on a couple of things that Keith had said about the different areas where, you know, Floyd was the face of, of different areas of inequities and also the issue of mass incarceration. One of the interesting things about Floyd's record, um, you know, when I was looking at his criminal record was, you know, he was, he started going to prison in the late 90s at a time when Texas's prison population was exploding and uh, growing at one of the fastest rates in the country. And some of the crimes he was sentenced for were so unbelievably minor, you know, very small amounts of crack cocaine possession. You know, in 2004, he did a $10 crack deal and was sentenced to 10 months in prison for that. Um, the officer, uh, police officer Gerald Goins, who filed that report in the last few years, was charged with murder in a in a raid that went wrong. Um, so there's efforts now to pardon Floyd after the fact from that. But I mean, if you look at like really much of his criminal record, aside from one aggravated robbery charge, was just nonviolent crimes, really small, petty amounts of drug sales, drug possessions. So I think he's also the face of some of the inequities on the war on drugs. And even um, I've been amazed that, you know, I get, you know, reporters get a lot of vitriolic email when you cover this stuff. And I get a lot of emails that are really pretty nasty commenting on Floyd's drug use, or they make it seem like because he had fentanyl and meth in his system, he deserved to die, or he's a monster. I mean, even at the Star Tribune just posts an article on Twitter about Floyd. I mean, that's just a whole range of, um, you know, comments that we get. And I feel like, you know, he, he suffered from an opioid addiction, painkiller addiction. I, I don't often see white people who are opioid addicts being, being talked about with the same level of vitriol. Um, so I think he's also just that face of some of the inequities on the war on drugs and that he started off getting these small minor drug charges when he was dealing with a lot of poverty in a very impoverished area. And that was kind of his way of supporting himself and surviving. Yeah. The, so the, the, the Goins situation in Houston, that, uh, that, I mean, you know, we now know that, that these narcotics officers in Houston for years had been lying to obtain search warrants and then, ex, you know, serving them in these extraordinarily violent ways. Um, and, you know, who knows how many times they, they lied about somebody raided an innocent person, but because, because that person, you know, had a couple of drug charges against them, the, you know, they believed the police over the person who was wrongly raided. And it wasn't until they raided this white couple, older white couple who, you know, had no criminal record and whose families stuck up, stuck up for them that we saw this investigation and which then revealed, you know, that these officers were, I mean, and I can tell you, if somebody's been writing about this for, again, you know, almost 20 years now, that is a very familiar pattern. I mean, in Atlanta, when they shot and killed Catherine Johnston, a 92-year-old woman in her own home during a drug raid, tried to plant pot in her basement to cover it up. You know, we saw an investigation. The investigation revealed that, you know, the, this had been the, the lies on the search warrants had been going on for years. They had raided other elderly women in the area by mistakenly by getting the wrong house. Um, you know, the, the drug war... I, I, I'm so glad to hear <laughs> to, 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 that, that you brought that up because it's just... Uh, it's been having this, these disproportionate effects for who knows how long, but it's also had the effect of, you know, militarizing the police, making the police uh, really reinforcing this kind of us versus them mindset, um, reinforcing this idea that it's, um, uh, you know, police aren't protecting and serving, that they're, they're out there confronting people who are threats to them. Uh, and of course, you know, again, that all is disproportionately on black and brown communities. I really wanted to thank all three of you for uh, joining this conversation today and providing some amazing insights into some of the, uh, the ways of thinking about uh, the situation that we're in, the year that we've had and more, as you pointed out, um, and the road ahead uh, and what it might bring. So um, thank you to Maya Rao, to Radley Balco, to Keith Boykin, and um, we're going to call it a day there. Thank you. Thanks.
Nice to meet both of you, or all three yeah, of you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs>